Good evening, everyone. My name is Guy, and I will share the last uh, session uh, dealing with accountability and sanctions. We have two speakers. Professor Jeffrey Cohn is a George Kilman uh, Chair of Criminal Law and Director of the Center for Military Law and Policy at the Texas Tech University. Uh, Professor Cohn and his BA from Hartwick College in New York, his G JD with the highest honors from George Washington University, and his LLM as a distinguished graduate from the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General School. Professor Cohn's teaching and scholarship focuses on the law of armed conflict, national security law, criminal law, and procedure. He has appeared as an expert witness in the at the Military Commission in Guantanamo, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and in U.S. Uh, federal courts. He's a co-author of a very impressive list of uh, books uh, dealing with uh, criminal law. And prior to joining academia, Professor Cohn served in the U.S. Army for 21 years as an officer, and a, a, a final year as a civilian legal advisor, in retiring in the rank of a lieutenant colonel. Upon retirement from the Army, he joined South Texas College of Law, Houston, where he was the, the Gray Cooper Distinguished Professor of National Security. Subsequently, he joined the Texas Tech University, and Professor Cohn would uh, address us with his paper about conduct crimes, attack results, and probative value. Advocate Mano Gila, yes. He's a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflicts and a consulting fellow in the Chatham House International Law Program. Uh, her uh, research interests include international humanitarian law with a particular focus on the protection of civilians in the conduct of hostilities and humanitarian assistance, the role of the Security Council in enhancing the protection of civilians, and the interplay between counterterrorism, sanctions, and humanitarian action. Uh, Manu <laughs> holds a BA in law and LLM from the University of Cambridge. She's a solicitor of the Supreme Court of England and Wales. She was the legal advisor at the United Nations Compensation Commission in charge of government claims for losses arising from Iraq's invasion and occupation of Kuwait from 1995 to 97. She was a research fellow at the Lauterpacht Research Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge. She was then the legal advisor of the International Committee of the Red Cross. There she was responsible for providing advice to headquarters in the field of legal issues relating to the protection of civilians. Subsequently, she was the chief of the protection of civilian section in the policy development and studies branch of the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. From there, she moved to Oxford. Advocate Gilad would address us with the, her paper, The Role of Sanctions in Responding to Russia's Invasion of Ukraine. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Again, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's a special treat to be on a panel with my friend Manu. Thank you to uh, Daphna Richmond Barak for making the trek up from <laughs> Tel Aviv or Herzliya to come and watch our presentation this afternoon. And thanks all of, to all of you for all of the great presentations and uh, involvement. It's so nice to be around old friends and to get to know uh, new people that I'm sure will be friends with for a long time. The main focus of my presentation is really almost as much as a question to all of you as it is a, a presentation from my perspective, which is, is there some kind of rational way we can think about allocating probative value to effects of attacks when assessing culpability for conduct of hostilities alleged war crimes? Uh, and I think the challenge there is that we're dealing with a set of war crimes that are all conduct based, but our instinct is to gravitate towards the results as the touchstone for liability or violation. And I, my, my basic thesis is that this is a potentially dangerous uh, path to go down because of the distorting effect it has on the way we should be assessing uh, compliance in the conduct of hostilities and respect <coughs> for international humanitarian law. Now, I've been a pretty ardent advocate against what I've called the tendency for critics of military operations to engage in effects-based condemnations. 
And much of that advocacy has actually come from projects I've been involved in uh, related to IDF operations in Gaza, where the kind of almost um, visceral instinct is to look at the effects of an attack and immediately attribute responsibility for alleged violations of IHL strictly on those attacks. And as I've said many times, that's basically like saying one plus I don't know equals five. I mean, you can look at the effect of an attack and you can see the destruction or the harm from an attack, but unless you know all the facts and circumstances that were available to frame the attack judgment, the ex ante judgment, you're distorting the regulatory effect of the law. But I will say that watching the news coming out of Ukraine has made me uh, kind of step back and reconsider this a little bit. Are there points at which the, the effects themselves are so powerfully probative that it's almost a res ipsa loquitur point where they speak for themselves, where the effects alone could support the inference of criminal responsibility for launching an illegal attack or an indiscriminate attack? On the other hand, I also am constantly reminded of the old adage that bad facts make bad law. And if we start to let the kind of extreme end of the spectrum of attack decision making that's reflected in so many of the operations conducted by the Russian armed forces and other forces in Ukraine, other forces meaning the Wagner Group and other participants in hostilities, then we run the risk of creating a false narrative, which is we can look only at the effects of an attack and extrapolate from that that there was violation. I think the most important thing that we have to constantly remind external audiences of is that the, the international humanitarian law targeting regime is not a results-based regime. It's a conduct-based regi regime. And Ironically, you can have results that suggest illegal conduct when in fact there was no illegal conduct, and you can have results where there is no harm when there was an actual effort to inflict <coughs> illegal harm. And so what we need to be focusing on is the ex ante decision-making process. And that, as most of you know, is reflected in the structure of the ICC crimes related to conduct of hostilities. Of course, the ICC includes crimes that are result-based. Actually, one of them, I think, is kind of illogical, which is the crime of treachery, which is the, the, the international criminal uh, manifestation of perfidy, which is defined as a result crime. You cannot convict somebody of treachery unless you prove that as a result of their abuse of trust, they produced some prohibited result, like death, injury, or for many states, capture of the opponent. To me, that's illogical. If, any, if ever there was a conduct-based violation of the principles of IHL, I think it's, it's perfidy. And I'm actually working on another paper now where I'm suggesting there needs to be more att attention focused on the notion of attempted perfidy to try and deal with uh, an individual who has the intent to abuse the trust but fails to produce the criminal result. But the crimes related to violation of distinction or proportionality, which we think of as targeting related crimes, are all conduct related. It's the crime of directing an attack, intending to attack civilians or civilian property, or directing or authorizing an attack or launching an attack with knowledge that that attack will result in clearly excessive collateral damage or incidental death or injury. So they're not result-based, they're not defined by result. And yet, it would be naive to suggest that the consequences of those attacks are irrelevant. So my basic thesis is that we have to remember that when we're dealing with attack effects, we're dealing with obviously relevant and probative evidence, but rarely dispositive evidence of criminal responsibility. Particularly when you transform an IHL regulatory norm, like the principle of distinction or proportionality, into an international or even domestic criminal standard. Because then you're injecting a whole new uh, element of complexity into the equation, which is the burden of production and the burden of persuasion. So it's not enough to look at the results of an attack and say, that looks unreasonable, that seems unreasonable. Uh, there is a burden that the prosecution must satisfy when alleging those offenses. And as most of you know, that burden at the ICC is extremely high. 
Actually, one of the things that, I, that I'm starting to think about, and we've spoken about this already, is whether it might be time to reconsider the, the scope of liability for attack violations. Because now you have the words intent and knowledge related to those two principal crimes. There has to be proof of an intent to attack civilians or civilian property or knowledge that your attack will result in indiscriminate effects on civilians or civilian property. And I understand that there's still ongoing debate over the kind of understanding of those terms. But it seems to me when you look at the articles of the ICC, that the article of the ICC that defines intent and knowledge, it's a classic subjective mental state. It's not an objective standard. So if you're going to prove a violation of, a, of an ICC provision related to launching an unlawful attack or an indiscriminate attack, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which means your evidence has excluded every other fair and rational hypothesis other than the conclusion that the authorizing commander or decision maker had the subjective intent, the purpose, to attack civilians or civilian property. And I think the indiscriminate attack is even harder because you have to prove that that individual had knowledge that the attack would result in a clearly excessive consequence, whatever that means. And why is that so complicated? Because when you're dealing with an indiscriminate attack, it presupposes that you're attacking a military objective. So you're, you're prosecuting a commander who made a decision to launch an attack on something that qualified as a military objective and then you're having to prove that when he, he or she launched the attack, he had subjective knowledge, substantial certainty that the attack would result in clearly excessive collateral damage or incidental injury. So I think that what this tells us is that we have to be very careful about how much emphasis we place on attack effects and to constantly uh, bear in mind that attack effects are important sources of circumstantial evidence of criminal state of mind, but are rarely in and of themselves dispositive. So we should be thinking about other sources of circumstantial evidence that we should instinctively look to, to try and assess a criminal state of mind. Now, even if we step back from that, even if we look at domestic crimes, for example, uh, a US military commander who launched an attack uh, as a result of a reckless decision, right? He knew there was risk that what he was attacking wasn't a military objective. He ignored the risk. You could say a reasonable commander would have been more cautious. You have, we have in our military code result crimes that would address that. Manslaughter, reckless endangerment, criminally negligent homicide. But even in those situations, particularly if we're talking about a recklessness standard, there still is a subjective component to recklessness. You have to prove that the, that the commander was at least aware of the unreasonable risk creation and just ignored it. So I think this, when we're, when we're thinking about how we judge compliance with not only IHL, but certainly with international criminal law in the relation to the conduct of hostilities, it really requires a kind of legal constant care obligation take constant care that we're not distorting the nature of the regulatory regime to reinforce this, this erroneous instinct for effects-based condemnations, for extrapolating from the results of an attack that the attack must have been unlawful. Um, I mean, even the one case that was raised today about the, the Ukrainian prosecution of the Russian soldier who shot the, the bicyclist, which I think on its face, I think any prosecutor would look at that and say that's prima facie evidence of an illegal attack. He wasn't in uniform, he was riding a bicycle. But there are facts that, that if I were defending that soldier, I would want to know. What was, did he have a phone in his hand? Were there, was there information being passed by any civilians to Ukrainian forces that were aiding them in conducting hostilities? Did that soldier who was given the order to fire realize that he was being ordered to conduct, uh, to engage in a clearly uh, illegal act? Or was it uncertain for him? Are we prosecuting the wrong person? And then I, I, I did read about another case where a Russian soldier who was a gunner on a piece of artillery was prosecuted for conducting an indiscriminate attack on civilians.
How does an artillery gunner who's given a coordinate and an order to pull a lanyard even know what he's shooting at? I mean, these are complex questions of conduct of hostilities crimes. I was speaking with one of the participants last night. I'm sorry, I can't remember. But they brought up a good, a good point. It was a long day. Come on. Give me a little break here. They brought up a good point. Maybe the ICC prosecutor is going to avoid those conduct of hostilities crimes because the other crimes are just so pervasive. The, the torture, the sexual violence, the deportation, the, the, the destruction of, of, of property, the looting. My brother was a diplomat in Russia for the, for the four years of the Trump administration, and he's fluent in Russian, and he sent me a joke that it was in Russian, and he translated it, and it was... Uh, Putin says to the Minister of Defense, have we taken Ukraine yet? And the minister says, no. And he says, well, what have we taken? He said, uh, a microwave and a couple of pairs of pants, right? So the idea of th there are crimes being committed that, that don't require this complexity. But the way we're talking about what we're seeing on the news, I think, risks a distortion of the law and a distortion of the expectation of commanders in the future. Because my concern over this effects-based condemnation methodology is that you start to build a paradigm where the external audience that observes military operations holds commanders to a standard that's just unrealistic and unattainable. They have to make reasonable judgments under the circumstances. Now, this is my point about maybe thinking about whether the scope of liability under the ICC statute for targeting crimes is too restrictive. I mean, I think, candidly, that there should be room for prosecuting commanders who recklessly uh, employ combat power in a manner that places civilians or civilian property in serious risk. And maybe this is going to lead to the unsurprising reality that uh, national level criminal prosecutions are going to be the dominant focus of conduct of hostilities crimes because the standards of culpability might be easier to meet in those situations. Still, I think when we think of conduct-based crimes that are normally kind of triggered by results, we have to think about where those results fit. So in the paper, the first thing I do is, is acknowledge that attack results are logically a, a logical focus for making the prima facie assessment of potential criminal responsibility. If I were a prosecutor, I would look at results and I don't think it's tremendously problematic to look at results as kind of a starting point to determine whether or not charges should be alleged against an individual. Uh, but I, again, even there, I think we have to be careful because we don't want to give a immunity to a commander who is inept at producing the, the illegal harm that he or she is actually trying to produce or maybe is incapable of doing it because of effective countermeasures like air defense assets or missile defense assets that prevent a commander who's trying to hit civilians from producing that outcome. To me, that commander is as worthy, worthy as condemnation as one that actually inflicts harm. Um, and I think that in order to think about how we prove this subjective standard, we also have to recognize that particularly in the conduct of hostilities, the expectation that you're gonna have a lot of direct evidence of criminal mental states is just unrealistic. And even when that evidence is available, oftentimes it's inconclusive without considering the broader circumstantial context. In the paper, as you probably noticed, Guy, I talked about the Godovina trial, where there was an order to place the city of Kanin under attack. That was the smoking gun for the prosecution. But when the, the fire support coordination officer took the witness stand and testified, that officer said, I understood what that order meant. We had pre-planned all the targets. And when I got that order, I understood that it meant attack the targets that had been pre-planned, which were military objectives. And, and of course, if Godovina had had a legal advisor sitting next to him when he was writing the order, the legal advisor would have said what? Don't say that. Say place the targets in the city of Kanin under attack. But is it realistic to expect every commander to have a lawyer sitting next to him or her for every order that's issued? I would suggest no. So even direct evidence is going to oftentimes be of, if you have it, of limited or qualified probative value. In my view, as a former prosecutor,
I think we undervalue the significance of circumstantial evidence. I think most prosecutors who've dealt with circumstantial evidence have, have pitched the argument to a jury or a judge that people can lie, but circumstances can't. Circumstances are what they are. So we should be thinking of what are the categories of circumstantial evidence that we should be focusing on when we're assessing non-compliance with IHL or even more challenging, whether or not a defendant had a subjective criminal mental state in relation to launching an attack, either because he was intending to attack civilians or she was intending to launch an indiscriminate attack. I think attack effects are logically at the top of the list. We're gonna look at the effects of the attack because that's oftentimes gonna give us an indication of what was in the commander's mind. But what else do we have to look at? And I think we should be thinking about categories of information or circumstantial evidence. Certainly the enemy situation, right? Was there any plausible basis for concluding that the enemy was in or around that target area? I think an area that is undervalued in this kind of assessment of a commander's state of mind related to an attack is whether or not the commander implemented precautions. Now, I lament the fact that a precautionary violation is not a crime in the ICC statute, mainly because I think it's one of the most objective standards related to the conduct of hostilities. It's one that's best assessed after the fact, looking at the situation, why didn't you issue a warning? Why didn't you let civilians evacuate? Why didn't you use this other weapon system when you had it available? And I know there's a subjective element of feasibility and context matters, but even without that as a crime, I think it is incredibly probative because I think a commander that makes an effort to implement precautionary measures is indicating a, a commitment to the civilian risk mitigation objective of precautions and the constant care obligation, which puts the actual effects of the attack in better context. Patterns of conduct, both from the defendant and the subordinates in the defendant's command? Are you dealing with a commander where the evidence is that the unit routinely violated IHL with impunity? Because if you are, that suggests you're dealing with a leader who not only tolerated that, but oftentimes encouraged it. But I also think you have to look at the pattern of enemy conduct. It's naive to suggest that when deciding whether or not what appears to be an illegal attack was illegal, that you don't consider the conduct, the tactics of the enemy you're confronting. Are they dressing like civilians? Are they using civilian property? Are they seeking to use civilians as human shields? Or are they seeking to exploit the presence of protected facilities in order to get some shielding effect? That is all relevant in assessing whether or not the effects of attack were the result of an illegal decision. Command commitment to investigations, right? When there are mistakes made by your subordinates, how aggressive are you in figuring out why they happened in order to try and develop measures and mechanisms to prevent them from happening in the future? I mean, this is classic command responsibility. If you know your subordinates are starting to deviate and you ignore it, you are in a sense setting the conditions for greater violations and we should pay attention to that as an indicator of good faith. And then, of course, I think the last aspect of circumstantial evidence that we really need to focus on is a commander's motive, right? If you can identify the commander's motive, are you really trying to defeat your enemy or are you actually trying to terrorize the civilian population? Motive is always circumstantial evidence of, of a criminal state of mind. And we should pay more attention to the overall motive of a commander's military campaign in order to assess whether specific acts of launching attacks were or were not in violation of IHL. And I know I'm out of time, and I don't want to steal Manu's time, and I want to see her bring the box of Legos up when she comes up to speak, and she can tell you why she has a box of Legos. I'm very proud of that. And I thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Please. It's a pleasure to be back. I have a box of Lego because I can't <laughs> read otherwise. So, I also have a box of Lego because Jeff Corns adopted my children and we find a way for him to deliver Christmas presents to them every year. So this is Leo's Christmas present. Please, it's a surprise. Try not to let him see what it is. 
It's really a pleasure to be back here. Um, Rohje, I don't want to get competitive, but I was here for the, the prequel. <laughs> okay, Minerva Conference, the prequel in Rishon Lezion. Um, I'm also tempted to go on strike and not give my presentation until Oleg gives me the opportunity to answer his King of Spain quiz or King of Sweden quiz, but um, I can wait. Um, this panel, it's, I'm very pleased it's not called the accountability panel because I'm going to talk about sanctions. And sanctions are not about accountability. Sanctions are one of the ways of promoting compliance. And in particular, in relation to Ukraine, to promote compliance with the prohibitions on the use of force, to promote compliance with IHL. So it's, it's broader than just accountability. And I think that it's very important for us, before we delve into the details of sanctions, to understand that both the decision to impose sanctions, but also the identification of the persons, the entities that are going to be targeted by them, are essentially a political decision. There is virtually no judicial process at that stage to the extent that there is judicial involvement. It is ex post facto and frequently very limited. There is now an opportunity for designated people to challenge their designation. So we've really got to understand that sanctions are not about accountability. They are about promoting compliance inter alia with, uh, with the law. So sanctions have played and continue to play a major role in the international community's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. For evident reason, the Security Council has not imposed sanctions, but an important number of states have done so. They have imposed a wide array of restrictions, and the number of, of targeted, of designated entities and persons is unprecedented. I'm going to kick off by briefly recalling how sanctions operate so we all have a shared understanding. And then I'm going to focus just on one specific dimension of sanctions. And I'm going to look in at how sanctions may adversely impact humanitarian activities in Ukraine, in response to the Ukraine crisis and beyond. And then I'm going to, to, to look at, briefly look at, I don't have the answer, the relatively unexplored question of whether assets that have been frozen under sanctions can be seized and used for reparations for violations that have occurred in the um, in the in the Russia in the Ukraine um, context. I don't have the answers. I'm going to flag it. I'd be interested to hear people's views on that. But first, very quickly, how do sanctions work? And this is just a general presentation. Sanctions are a range of measures adopted by the UN by regional organizations, most notably the EU, and also individual states, with the aim of influencing the behavior of the parties that are designated without recourse to the use of force. What is the objective of sanctions, how they, they seek to attain it? As I said, they seek to bring about a change in policy or conduct for a variety of objectives in order to preserve peace, end conflicts, promote compliance with human rights and IHL, and so on. They seek to do the, this by imposing a range of restrictions. These can include embargoes <clears throat> on the provision of weapons or equipment, other export restrictions, restrictions on admissions, so travel bans, um, and financial sanctions, which include asset freezes and the prohibition of making funds or assets available. And these restrictions are imposed on the people or entities whose behavior the sanctions aim <coughs> to change. These are referred to as designated or listed or targeted peoples or entities. Who are they? Usually government leaders, entities such as companies that provide the means to conduct the targeted uh, policies, groups or organizations um, <coughs> such as terrorist groups often, and as well as private individuals that play a key role in, um, in the policies that the sanctions are trying to modify. Now, the UN and the EU 
aim to impose smart or targeted sanctions that only res apply to the individuals that are designated. Um, unilateral measures adopted by some states are broader in nature, um, more akin to comprehensive sanctions on countries as a whole, and they risk having ind um, indiscriminate effects. Um, my, the, the focus of my work has been on how restrictions in sanctions can affect humanitarian action the capacity of humanitarian actors to respond in situations of armed conflict. This is something narrower than the humanitarian impact of sanctions more broadly. Um, and that is something that is obviously of concern, but something that's far, far harder to establish as a matter of causation. It's very difficult in most contexts to say that this particular humanitarian consequence on the population is due to sanctions. Why? Sanctions are frequently imposed in situations of conflict that have humanitarian effects. The leaders whose positions the sanctions aim to change are likely to have implemented undesirable policies that have un, um, humanitarian effects of themselves. It's very, very difficult to establish causation with um, with the sufficient degree of clarity. Um, so I'm only focusing on the potential unintended impact on humanitarian action. Sanctions can affect humanitarian action in a variety of ways. For example, we might have restrictions on import of dual use items that cover items of materials that humanitarian actors need for operations in areas such as water purification, agriculture, and even medical response. We saw that during COVID. I think the type of restrictions that tend to have the most significant adverse impact on humanitarian action are financial sanctions, and in particular, the prohibition on making funds or assets available to designated individuals or groups, because um, it could be that you have actors who are designated that play a governance role. Hamas is designated under some counterterrorism measures. I was recently in Afghanistan. The Taliban are designated by the US. How does that, how do we deal with that reality when implementing humanitarian activities, we need to pay taxes, fees? What about diversion of assets that end up in the hands of designated groups in particular? It's still caught by the letter of the law. Commercial companies whose services humanitarian actors may require for operations, for example, telecommunication providers, airline companies might be designated. And there might be other prohibitions that have a direct impact on the capacity to operate. In Syria, the EU originally had a prohibition on the purchase of petroleum products. You couldn't even get your vehicle out of the garage. So there are a number of ways in which sanctions can impede humanitarian action. I think that increasingly there, there is a, an awareness of this. And the actors that impose sanctions have started including safeguards within the sanctions to minimize the risk of these unintended consequences. They can take a variety of different forms. They can be exceptions that from the outset say humanitarian activities are not covered by the scope of the exemption of the prohibitions. It could be exceptions that only cover certain humanitarian actors. It could be general licenses or specific licenses. So a range of modalities. The approach adopted varies sanctions regime by sanctions regime. So that's the general issue. Um, let's look at the principal restrictions um, that have been imposed in Ukraine-related sanctions that are of important, of relevance to humanitarian response. <clears throat> and um, those of us who've been working on sanctions were really struggling to deal with the flurry of sanctions that were imposed following, principally, following the invasion in February. It was really, they came hard and fast. They were very broad, very significant number of actors imposing sanctions. It was really difficult to keep on top of it and determine um, what the, the types of sanctions and how they potentially impeded humanitarian action. Essentially, we had sanctions that were targeting a number of Russia's key economic sectors, oil, energy, um, aviation, space, significant trade restrictions, significant restriction of the economic sector in terms of 
um, engagement with Russian financial institutions, and also the more garden variety financial sanctions that I've been mentioning um, that require the freezing of assets and include a prohibition on making funds or assets available to designated individuals. What was staggering is, although those rules are quite clear, we know what they are, it's 1,500 persons and entities have been designated. This is really a very significant number, and it is hard, it was hard to determine how they could potentially impact humanitarian action. And um, the most significant uh, sanctions that are relevant to humanitarian operations are trade restrictions and financial <coughs> sanctions. In the interest of time, I'm not going to enter into the trade restrictions. The most significant ones relate to the import of goods originally in Luhansk and Donetsk um, areas. As of October, following mm -hmm. the um, announcement of the annexations, the trade restrictions apply to the, the four regions, but there are, for the most part, adequate um, safeguards for humanitarian action to allow them to bring goods into these areas. I think it's more interesting to look at what has happened in terms of the financial sanctions. And again, let me remind you there's two elements to this. There's a requirement to freeze the assets of designated persons and entities, and there's a prohibition on making funds or assets available to them directly and indirectly. And it is the second dimension that is most relevant to humanitarian action. It's important to bear in mind that the financial sanctions are not limited geographically. Once a person or entity is designated, it's prohibited to provide them funds or assets in any transaction, wherever it may occur in the world. And immediately we have attention because you're going to see the exemptions that have been granted tend to be limited to either response in Ukraine or potentially response to the Ukraine crisis. But some of these actors operate in other contexts. And there may be points of tension with humanitarian action, which isn't currently covered by the exceptions. Um, I think it's, it's interesting. What's been fascinating to watch, taking a step back, is the interplay between the EU, Switzerland, and the UK in how they have adopted safeguards for humanitarian action. So the example that I was looking at pre-2022, February, was the designation of the two republics, Luhansk and Donetsk. They were designated for the purpose of financial sanctions by by the EU, by Switzerland, by the UK, but there were no safeguards for humanitarian action. What did this mean? That any humanitarian actors that were operating in these two regions and were making payments, fees, taxes, licenses to the two republics were actually violating sanctions. There was no exception. It was a problem, but it was a problem that was unresolved until 2022 when suddenly because of the significant sanctions that had been imposed more broadly, it became apparent that it was necessary to find a solution. So it, it was interesting that um, the EU adopt what sorry what the EU adopted the most significant number of designations and actors such as Switzerland, for example, replicated them. They replicated the prohibitions, they replicated the list of designations. but interestingly, Switzerland, from the outset actually included an exception for humanitarian act uh, action. And it was a very broad exception in terms of the actors that are covered. When you look at the safeguards, you've got to look at which actors, which activities. And the Swiss one was very broad in terms of the actors that were covered. It was um, essentially bodies that receive funding from the Swiss government. That provided Switzerland a reassurance. But it was interesting to see that it was anyone who received funding from the Swiss government for activities anywhere. So it's not that you needed to receive them in order to implement your operations in Ukraine. It was for anything. Clearly, Switzerland said, if I'm funding you, I feel that you have adequate measures in place to ensure that um, measures are not diverted, uh, that goods are not diverted. It's interesting to see also what activities are covered. Um, and it is, they have a broad geographical scope. It is um, humanitarian activities in relation to the situation in Ukraine. 
So it covers humanitarian um, action in Ukraine, but also in neighboring states. Nudged, I think, by what Switzerland was doing and also the fact that humanitarian actors were saying, hey, we've got problems. Switz uh, Switzerland, sorry, the EU in April adopted an exception, finally. It's felt the exception, as in go ahead and do it, is quite narrow. It only covers the essentially the UN, ICRC, the Federation, and IOM. So a very narrow category of humanitarian actors. Everyone else needs to go and ask for authorization. What's important there is the scope, and it's quite limited. It is for humanitarian activities in Ukraine. So it's limited geographically. If these actors are responding to the humanitarian, to the um, Ukraine crisis, but in neighboring states, they do not fall within the scope of the EU safeguards. And this is problematic, obviously. Why? Again, 1,500 designated persons or entities. They are inevitably in neighboring states. I'm not going to go into what the UK has done. It has essentially replicated the Swiss approach and gone a step further. It has covered um, humanitarian assistance and activities to meet basic um, human needs. That's to cover development action. So it's been a really interesting engagement between these actors that impose sanctions. Is it um, ideal? I'll come to, to that. In a, uh, is it ideal? Um, it takes time. The dust needs to settle. You need to see who these actors are. And I would say that in my work, the one problem that, remain, that exists is that um, as of July 2002, Sberbank, and you'll be familiar with this, it's one of the biggest commercial companies in Russia, has been <coughs> designated. And problems have arisen because it is the bank that's often used to make payments to non-designated actors and entities for humanitarian actors to pay their rent, to pay for services. The Russian Red Cross was using Sberbank. And so even though the final recipients of the payments were not designated, as a matter of the letter of the law, they were caught by this. So I'd say this is one example of where problems still arise. I'm just going to flag from freeze to seize. I've got five minutes. And something that has received some attention is relates to the second part of the, the financial sanctions, the, the asset freeze. And there have been calls for this property that belongs to the Russian state, that belongs to the many oligarchs. <coughs> Here's a pot of money that's blocked. Can we use it for reparations? And there have been a small number of states that have, have looked at it. The, the EU is, has established a, a fund for rehabilitation and has been encouraged to let's look at what can be done with these frozen assets. Um, and the answer so far is there are a variety of legal issues that we need to look at. Um, UK, US are also reluctant. Canada, on the other hand, already had um, a law in place, Special Economic Measures Act and Justice for Victims of Corrupt Officials Act, the, the Magnitsky Law, that foresaw the possibility of seizing some of these frozen assets and using them for reparations. So Canada is the only example to date. Other states are, I think, rightly reluctant to move from freeze to seize. Let me conclude. Um, where do we stand next? I, I am very reluctant to ever answer the question, are sanctions effective in meeting their purpose? I, I always don't go there. The example I give in relation to Afghanistan, where I've recently been, is that the vice president of the Afghan Red Crescent was designated. He's been designated for 20 years. 20 years, he did not know that. He did not know that. Deterrent effect, nil. However, the <coughs> fact that he was the vice president of the Afghan Red Crescent meant that a lot of donors to the Afghan Red Crescent, the only actor that could cooperate, operate throughout the country, said, designated by president, we're not giving you funding. That is not effective. I would say that when we look at, at the Russia sanctions, they hurt. They, they, they catch the assets of people that are aware of it, and, and it hurts. So I'd say this is a context where, for example, financial sanctions do make sense. Um, do we have um, outstanding problems? I, I think Sberbank, to me, and my engagement with the EU indicated that sometimes states say, oh, we're not aware of the unintended uh, effects. Tell us. So fine, I, I became aware of the problem with, in relation to Sberbank and told them. And the example I gave was, it impedes our capacity to operate in Russia. And then suddenly you've got EU member states saying, why do you want to operate in Russia? 
Who are you responding to? Those people have been forcibly displaced. Why are you providing them humanitarian assistance? So suddenly a conversation that they invited that was meant to be about let's improve our sanctions regime became an opportunity for them to question humanitarian action. They don't need to fund these activities if they don't like them, but sanctions is not the way to do this. And finally, from freezing to seizing, work in progress, I think that perhaps it might be more feasible when we're talking about state property, but then we have questions about the sovereign immunity of the states. Can you attach their property? When it comes to the private property of the, of the oligarchs, for example, as tempting as it might be, I think we have lots of challenges there. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I would offer uh, short comments with respect to the two papers, and then we can open the floor for question and discussion. So I will uh, start with Jeff's uh, paper. Uh, I, I find my role as a discussant of your paper to be difficult in the sense that we, in academia, we make our earnings from uh, arguing and criticizing and not accepting the arguments. And I carefully read the paper, and I, I would subscribe to the thesis and to the details too. I, I believe that uh, international criminal law should be implemented in a way that would significantly rest, uh, restrict or limit impunity. For that, you need evidence. Direct evidence usually are lacking, and you need circumstantial evidence. And I, I do agree that attack effects can and should be treated as relevant for the purpose of establishing the mens rea of the relevant offenses, i.e. intent or knowledge. I do believe that the outcome might be relevant in the process of inferring uh, su such a uh, mental uh, position. <coughs> and I do agree that, generally speaking, it is very difficult to imagine a situation whereby uh, th uh, this effect uh, would be conclusive. And then so I, I agree that um, we must uh, examine the evidence of the, of the outcome uh, and its wider, or widest uh, uh, context of the attack uh, situation, so as to establish whether the entirety of evidence uh, leads us to the conclusion that the attack and its outcome met or did not meet the mens rea. And I believe that uh, such an examination requires a very careful uh, and thorough examination of the totality of evidence, evidence both direct and indirect. And um, I would invite you, certainly the Israelis, to read uh, a decision by the Israeli Supreme Court, I believe delivered uh, six or seven months ago. Is it um, the Bahar, if I pronounce the name correct, of, of the case? A very short judgment, 11 pages. And the judgment uh, dealt with uh, the tragic outcome of an aerial attack by the Israeli forces during the Sukaitan attack of 2014, leading to the death of four teenagers, the age of 10 or 11, I believe. The outcome was tragic. The uh, military prosecutor examined the case and re reached the conclusion that uh, opening criminal investigation is not justified. There was some appeals against the decision. It was supported by the Attorney General. The issue was brought before the Supreme Court of Israel. And the Supreme Court, in a very anorectic uh, judgment, came to the conclusion that the entire process was, was uh, justified. And the outcome, this tragic outcome, only was taken into account in only one perspective, and that is uh, uh, deciding not to impose costs on on those who launched the appeal, but otherwise uh, the, the court came to the conclusion that the tragic events uh, cannot uh, lead us to the conclusion of, of knowledge or intent. Again, I, I'm not against the conclusion, but when you read the judgment, I think that's not the, the, the careful and very thorough examination that you are advocating for. So my conclusion is that I agree with you. I think that we should be very careful about ascribing excessive weight to the outcome. I, I believe it would ad undermine the foundation of those offenses, and I, I think it would excessively erode the presumption, presumption of innocence. At the end of the day, we're in the business of the offenses that depend on the ex ante state of mind. And 
if you are in the process of taking into account the undesired uh, effect, I think for the sake of symmetry, you should also take the unintended uh, uh, effects of, of, of the military advantage too. And I think that, uh, I believe, I, I haven't asked you, but I believe that uh, you would apply your thesis in equal mm. terms, both to international uh, proceedings and to national criminal proceedings. And I believe, but I'm not sure that uh, your thesis is relevant not only to the issue of finding or not finding guilt, but to the initial questions as to whether to open an investigation as to bring le le criminal legal proceedings and maybe also for the punishment itself. Uh, my last comment is that uh, your paper is based on doctrinal analysis of international law. And um, I think it, you can find theoretical support in, in scholarship uh, belonging to jurisprudence, juris jurisprudence law. Uh, I, I read bef before the meeting, uh, before the session, uh, um, s some writings dealing with the uh, uh, moral and, and legal luck written by David Enoch and others. And David, who is a member of our faculty, argues, if I understand his argument, that criminal punishment should be proportional to the moral blameworthiness of the offender for having committed the crime and such blameworthiness may not be changed in principle depending on the factors that are beyond the offender's control or on factors that may be treated as a matter of bad luck. So I think that theory supports your analysis. Uh, with respect to the, your paper, uh, you emphasized at the outset that uh, sanctions are not, shouldn't be linked to, to excessively to issues of accountability, accountability in the sense that they are more concerned with uh, providing incentives for implementation or obedience. And you list in your paper certain motives beyond behind the sanctions, including preserving peace and ending conflicts and promoting compliance, etc. cetera. Uh, but my question in this very particular uh, context of, of the invasion of Russia is whether those motives were actually the domineering ones in this giving Russians uh, willing uh, resilience or willingness to pay a very high prices and the experience could, that can be drawn from the Crimea uh, invasion. So that was my first uh, comment. The second comment was that y y you analyze the safeguards uh, which are intended to minimize the unintended collateral uh, humanitarian damage and my question is whether, paradoxically, unilateral sanctions, as compared with multilateral sanctions, they carry a smaller risk of such a... Uh, it's a question. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not in the business of sanctions, but I'm speaking out of intuition. My third comment is, when I read your paper, I thought of a proportionality test, when you just balance the anticipated uh, gains to be drawn from the sanctions and weigh them against the anticipated uh, price or cost in, in, in terms of humanitarian damage. And I, I believe this is an impossible test in the sense that it's too elusive. So I guess that there's no place for it in, in, in real world. And I wanted to ask you about your final point with respect to seizure and confiscation, then using the money for reparation. Uh, how would you explain the fact that, if I understand correct, uh, both unilateral and multilateral sanctions imposed through the machinery of the Security Council do not use this instrument. What's the reason for for the lack of such a usage? So this is my modest contribution to the evening. Thank you. Um, okay, so the first question is uh, for Jeff, actually, about, um, so we're talking about accountability and sanctions. So I want to focus with you on the accountability <coughs> part. Um, and I don't know if this is something that was discussed yesterday, and if so, I'm sorry about that. But to me, and also previously in, in a previous panel, this was also very striking, how much information um, is being made available in this particular case of the Russia-Ukraine war during the conflict, as the conflict is still ongoing, and how much of the assessment of violations um, is currently being done, and, and, and how this is very different from the way things are traditionally 
conducted. Usually this is an ex post facto assessment, which is being done, as you mentioned, Jeff, repeatedly by a prosecutor, when usually the conflict has already ended. And I'm wondering if the context of the, the very specific context here, where we're discussing all of this in the midst of the conflict, does this have any impact in how we conduct this assessment? Does it um, maybe change somewhat the balance between uh, what matters mo most, the conduct or the effects? I'm wondering if you see an impact of this particular uh, element of, of uh, the accountability process here, where universal jurisdiction is going on and uh, uh, you know, um, cases being prosecuted inside domestic courts uh, in parallel to international processes. So all of this is very, I think, puzzling and interesting if we're looking at it in comparison to other um, other instances of conflict. And now for Manu about the sanctions. Um, so um, I, I very much agree with you when you talk about uh, what it, what are the unique features of these sanctions. Uh, you know, how, how many of these sanctions, how difficult it has been to keep track, how uh, who has been imposing these sanctions and against whom. And I see that it has really hardened and made your work more difficult in a way. I can hear the struggle in your voice. Um, but it is something that I want to ask you, maybe taking a step back, and it's not so much related to the humanitarian action, but. Um, more to the uniqueness, again, of the moment. Um, and you talked about how sanctions are imposed by the UN, by regional organizations, and individual states. But until now, um, the individual states part of this equation was relatively... Um, there were certain states who were known as the usual kind of suspect, and were doing this on a regular basis. Uh, but now it's become kind of almost, I want to say, the norm, or I guess that's where my question goes, right? Are we looking at a paradigm shift in how sanctions are being imposed? Is uh, what we've witnessed with Russia, is this going to be what it, what is going to, you know, what we're likely to see going forward? Um, is this kind of here to stay? And is your work going to be hard like this forever? So that's my question to you. Thank you so much. Thank you both for two uh, great presentations. I have uh, a couple of quick questions to Jeff. Um, so the first is, what um, do you think of situations where, in terms of the effects, um, the answer given when, when you ask the, the attacker is, you know, it was a mistake, mm -hmm. right? We didn't expect there to be civilians in this area. The, the blast radius was, you know, was inaccurate. Uh, is there, a, and this is at least from my perspective, I once had to explain these issues to a, to a reporter. And my line was, um, at some point, you lose the right to say, oops. Right? So if the same mistake happens again and again and again, and sort of you're giving the same excuse in terms of um, your, your reason for, for these effects. I, I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that. Uh, and the second point is, and again, I, I pretty much agree with everything you said. What do you suggest to do in situations when, given that we don't have all the facts, but the attacking side simply never provides any information, right? And lack of cooperation. Does that mean that you know we're, we're basically rendered uh, essentially helpless in ever making a determination? Because as we know, that happens a lot, and that is particularly relevant for, yeah. for the conflict we're discussing now. Makes sense. So maybe you respond, and then I would collect another round. OK, let me start with answering your two questions. First off, and it may just be because of my criminal law mind, but mistake is directly linked to mens rea, right? So mistake is, a, the, the way I teach it, it's, it's an obstacle, right? If, if, I, if you have to prove a purely subjective mental state, intent or knowledge, then a purely honest mistake is a complete obstacle to proving it. I can't intend to kill civilians who I honestly believe are not civilians. I can't. And, and, and so... <laughs> And so all of the writing this paper and thinking about this conference has really made me start to move to the conclusion that the standard for culpability for targeting violations is too demanding. It should be an objective standard because because an because when you allege mistake and you have an objective standard say of recklessness, then you get to your point which is at some point you can't say oops. Because why? Because maybe it was oops to you but the evidence is sufficiently persuasive so that a reasonable person in your situation wouldn't have made that analogous mistake. <coughs> Hence, I've proven the requisite criminal state of mind. And I thought a lot about um, uh, 
you know, again, in our own military code, if I were prosecuting a commander for a uh, attack decision that went wrong, I wouldn't just be restricted to looking at intent or knowledge. I would be looking at objective standards as well. So I think that by requiring proof of intent or knowledge, you are actually elevating the probative value of alleged mistakes and creating a much more difficult burden on the part of the prosecutor to rebut them. Your issue of lack of access to information, it's actually something when I made the proposal, I actually put it in, although I, I, didn't, I didn't develop it in the, in too much in the paper. The problem I have is, in one way, you might adopt a rule that said it's almost like an adverse inference. If, if, <coughs> if we need information about why you conducted an attack and, and you prevent us from getting it, then it supports an adverse inference against the defendant. The problem is the defendant's not the one who's preventing you from getting the information in most cases. It's the state, right? So to me, it's inequitable from a defense standpoint to say if I'm a commander who's put on trial and my state refuses to declassify the information related to the attack decision, that that, that draws an adverse inference against me. I think one thing we have to accept with conduct of hostilities crimes is that it is going to be common where a prosecutor is just going to say, I'm deeply suspicious that this may have been a violation, but I'm not going to be able to muster the proof I need to satisfy the criminal burden of proof. It doesn't mean there wasn't a regulatory violation. It means I can't meet the burden and access to information is gonna be a factor that plays into that. Um, Daphna, on your question, uh, it goes to the same issue, right? Information being available, and trying to make these decisions in the in the conduct of operations, I think what we're seeing and what was the motivation for writing the paper and making the proposal is it's almost inevitable that effects are kind of bubbling to the surface of the primary focus of critique, right? When, we, when we're in the midst of the war and we don't have the opportunity to carefully assess everything and go back and try and recreate the situation, it's too convenient to just look at the effects of an attack and draw an ipso facto conclusion from those effects. Now, as I said, I mean, I've watched the news like all of you and, and certainly our colleagues who've come from Ukraine have felt this much more personally than any of us. But I look at some of the operations and say, I think the effects alone are, are near conclusive of illegality, right? There, there's no plausible basis for concluding something's a military objective and a tank just fires five or six rounds into an apartment building. I don't know what plausible alternative there is. So I do think there are times when effects alone can satisfy the, this burden of proof. But I think when we make that decision, both from a charging perspective and an ultimate culpability perspective, we have to be very clear that those are outlier situations and not the norm. Um, and, and I also think, again, your question, pu again, pushes me towards the conclusion that linking criminal responsibility for attack decisions to a purely subjective criminal mental state is too restrictive. And it's, and it's more restrictive than is demanded of commanders in practice, because the standard we demand of them, as we all know, is the reasonable commander standard, which is inherently objective. <laughs> Thank you, Guy and, and Daphne. Um, Guy, uh, the, the reasons for which the sanctions were imposed, I think the reasons were very clear. It was to, <coughs> to try and change the behavior. Um, and the international community has been looking for ways short of the use of force to get Putin to change his behavior. I think the challenge with sanctions, and everyone is aware of it, is that they don't have an immediate effect. Right, there, there's no expectation that as a result of the imposition of sanctions, things are going to change. And I think it's been interesting to see the attempt to ratchet out up more and more and more restrictions. Um, I think the EU is now on its eighth round of sanctions. It's really difficult to identify any additional types of restrictions. Um, um, unilateral sanctions. Mm -hmm is the, the risk of, unimpeded, of unintended consequences on humanitarian action lower. And I think it's, it's been fascinating to take a step back and watch how 
unilateral sanctions, the whole interplay between unilateral sanctions, EU sanctions, UN sanctions. So for a time, it was the US that was the, the key problem. It was imposing sanctions everywhere and not including measures to prevent their impact on humanitarian action. We had some good behavior at UN, a good, good practice at UN level, but only in relation to, to one context, Somalia, and EU was, um, was really beginning to tackle it, maybe because it was imposing sanctions more generally. And then since, I'd say, the, the Biden administration, it's the US that every time it imposes sanctions has coupled them with a very good exception for humanitarian action. So the actors have changed. Well, before I was looking to Brussels for good practice, it's now Washington that in many ways is setting the good practice. So it's, it's really moving. It's fascinating to watch. On the proportionality front, there's very little legal review at any stage of the process. The only legal review that there is is should someone have been designated, yes or no, do they meet the criteria for designation? So com questions such as proportionality are definitely not addressed from a legal perspective. You're the IAR professor. I think that's the moment to be looking at the effect of sanctions in, in terms of balancing in, impact and adverse effect. From freeze to seize, why it's not happened? Because sanctions are not meant to be punitive. They're not there to confiscate the property. It's just uh, the financial sanctions part of it is just to prevent them from using it for their problematic purposes. It was just meant to block it. So that's why sanctions themselves never do this. And I think, again, from a, a right to property <coughs> perspective, there are significant problems in using it. Um, and it was interesting to see the states that expressed reluctance. Some of them framed it as a, a legal concerns. Others framed it from more from a political perspective. If we start seizing the prop, our property, no one's going to come at assets. No one's going to come and invest here. Or if we start seizing property, that's going to happen to our property abroad. So more your realm than mine. Daphne, shouldn't hear a struggle in my voice. If any struggle there was, it was to con convey my passion for sanctions to you. Why? That's how I make my living. So I'm very happy that everyone's having increased resource recourse to this. I, I, I'm joking, but I, I'm, I'm very happy that there is an increased awareness of the need to comply with sanctions and increased willingness from states to, to try and minimize their unimpended impact. I think um, it's become a political battleground, definitely between I'd say the P3, so US, uh, UK, and France, and Russia and China, mm -hmm. sanctions have become a battleground. I was going to say we're not going to see the Security Council imposing new sanctions. It's just done so a few weeks ago on Haiti. Amazing. Unanimous um, resolution by the Security mm -hmm. Council on sanctions on Haiti with a good exception for humanitarian action. But I'd say definitely the EU is making <coughs> really significant recourse to sanctions. The US always has. You know, I, I was troubled a bit during the Trump administration. Sorry, but he would designate people to, to mark the anniversary of something bad. And I'm thinking, if you want to mark the anniversary of something bad, issue a stamp or something. Don't designate people under sanctions. For the record, you don't have to be sorry about being a little upset. <laughs> OK, I don't know why you gave me that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Maybe I can collect another round of, of questions. Danny, you tell me where to stop because I have a weak character and if, if it would be up to me, we'd stay all night here. So maybe, yes. Thank you. Thank you very briefly because I know I'm jumping the line here. Um, I'm wondering whether um, the discussions you're having about the uh, individual criminal responsibility, um, is it always the best way to go, especially in cases of mistakes? Uh, because we also have state responsibility for violations of IHL. We have Article 91 of, um, yeah, of AP1. Uh, I think very few people would question whether it's customary, given that it reflects uh, Article 3 of uh, the Hague regulations. So. Rather than stretching the boundaries of ICL, should we go back to state responsibility? It's just a potential alternative. Um, and Manu, you answered my other question about uh, protected rights and the distinction between rights and between the sanctions which can potentially infringe on protected rights and other which are just you know, uncomfortable. Uh, so I don't need to ask this one. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Magda actually covered some of my point. Also, I would say Article 91 doesn't solve the problem of mistakes because there still has to be a violation in the... Uh, in 
Okay, so so at least the text w is open to the suggestion that you have to you have to start with a violation, but it certainly it may cover the the failure to cooperate at some level, uh, if if we can establish that. I mean, my, my question to you, Jeff, is about how do you factor in the analysis willful blindness? Blindness. I mean. <laughs> And whether um, you could tie perhaps your your point, which I thought was very interesting about the precautionary um, obligations with willful blindness. Yeah. So if you as a commander, you're not conducting any sort of impact assessment, um, whether you could then go down that road. That That is my question. And, and Manu, I mean, uh, Maybe on the oligarch, you, you, this was really very, at, at the end of your presentation, you said it's very problematic at the very least. Uh, can, can, you, um, can you perhaps uh, present what is in your, in your mind the best case for? I mean, not that I have a lot of sympathy for that, but the Magnitsky Act type of, of uh, sanctions, which is, I, I think, some, somewhat between sanctions and accountability, actually, because uh, they're... Uh, I, I'm not sure that the logic of that that strand of sanction law uh, is, is applicable here. So I would be interested to to hear your thoughts about what would be the the framework which uh, which we should apply to analyze these um, this decision. Thank you. So I have to say that one of the great joys of coming to this conference is the moment that you ask the question because I always feel like a student in a class. And uh, the issue of willful blindness, I think. I, I think it could be useful, but I think willful blindness generally is just a almost a subtle way of saying it's a different way of drawing an inference, right? If you're the willful blindness arises when the fact finder makes a determination that the defendant was in fact ignorant, and then you use the deliberate connivance or whatever we want to call it as a substitute for knowledge, right? But the factors that lead to willful blindness, I think, also could support an inference of the requisite criminal intent. So, and I agree with you 100%. I think that, well, I mean, this is no surprise to people who, who've heard me speak before. We undervalue precautions across the entire spectrum of military operations. And I think we undervalue them in the realm of individual criminal responsibility. And one of the reasons I think we should place more emphasis on precautions as circumstantial evidence is because we want to incentivize commanders to be more aggressive in using precautions. So if they know that this is going to weigh in their favor in order to avoid the inference of knowledge or intent resulting from the deliberate ignorance, then they're more likely to embrace that obligation, which increases the protection of the civilian population. Listen, I think that individual criminal responsibility is one piece in a mosaic of compliance mechanisms, right? And it, the, the challenge, I think, for the prosecutor at the ICC, for the chief prosecutor in Ukraine, for uh, states that have universal jurisdiction statutes. By the way, our, our Senate is reconsidering the War Crimes Act now, and there's a, there's a push to finally bring our domestic federal criminal law in line with universal jurisdiction. I think the challenge is the, the public expectation when we talk about accountability is not what international lawyers think of. When they don't, the international lawyers think of this broad mosaic, the public assumes if I see this and it looks evil, somebody should be, should be in front of a, a court being prosecuted for this. So there's this kind of instinct to look to international criminal law as the panacea for dealing with violations. Although I do think there's <coughs> that as, as Yuval says, the state responsibility issue can, re can address the, the resistance of the state to provide information. But we know that historically there is a deterrent value in uh, kind of derelict military leaders knowing that the sword of Damocles is hanging over their head somewhere. So the fact that there are investigations and there is an effort to leverage criminal law as inefficient as it might be, in and of itself can produce a deterrent effect that might not otherwise be produced by other compliance mechanisms. Thank you, Yuval. Um, problematic at, at the very least. Again, the process um, whereby individuals are designated and their assets um, frozen is not a legal process. So there's basis for determining whether
someone can be designated. And then if you look at the EU, for example, the political advisors of 27 member states agree that this particular individual lawyer, oh yeah, he's done that, and, the, and so his assets are frozen. That's definitely not enough as a, as a matter of human rights law, I would say, in terms of judicial process. There's no judicial process involved in making this determination. Definitely not enough to de deprive that particular individual of his or her property, to, to confiscate it. If you look at the, the Magnitsky Act, and I have uh, the Magnitsky style sanctions, these foresee the possibility of, in a way, horizontally targeting specific individuals in a variety of contexts for their involvement in various types of wrongdoing. But again, there is no determination that that particular individual has, in fact, committed torture or has been involved in corruption. There's just the political bodies that are involved in the imposition of sanctions that make this determination. So I was looking, and so far it's only Canada that's, that's done this. So they've amended their um, Special Economic Measures Act and Justice for Victims of Corrupt Foreign Officials Act to create legal regimes that allow the forfeiture. And there I suppose you've got corruption, you've got the crime. So, but again, it, it doesn't say, and we're going to immediately forfeit them, it says, we're going to create a legal regime that allows it. So I presume that in that legal regime, you're going to have both a determination that that particular individual has actually committed a crime and that gives the opportunity to the individual to dispute it. So they're, they're just diff two completely different instruments. Excellent. One more round of questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so may maybe, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for two very interesting presentations that have kept us awake at this late hour. Um, What's well, the penultimate? We still have another one. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, a, a question to Manu, because you said, so in Canada there is apparently like a procedure, but what is then the standard of proof that you would expect for something like that? Or should there be one specific standard and always a causal link between the person and uh, conduct of a person and, and what the, uh, the freezing is for. Um, to Jeff, um, yeah, very interesting proposals. We've talked about this. I think uh, it, it would be very helpful if some of those would be implemented. But I understand your categories of circumstantial evidence to, to be in lieu of any kind of update or additional um, that just working with the, the system that we have now. So then if you look at pattern of conduct, for um, how would that work in the early days of a conflict? Like the first round of strikes that, which are often the, especially kind of the, the, you know, the air bombardments, et cetera. Um, and you already indicate like patterns of conduct, com commander's motive that comes kind of close to command responsibility. So if, can you have command responsibility for um, uh, for targeting violations? And in that regard, do you still need to prove knowledge of the actual individual uh, targeting? And related to that, in your view, can you have the intent and knowledge? Do they have to lie with the same person? Or can they be with different persons? That's a good question I would ask you. No, listen, I think that, again, I mean, doctrinally, I think, or instinctively, I think we would say that a commander who uh, should have known that subordinates were going to intentionally target civilians is culpable for that targeting under the mode of liability of command responsibility. So I don't think command responsibility requires the same culpable mental state as the crime committed by the subordinate. It's an attribution or a mode of liability. And it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, if you know you have a, 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 a miscreant subordinate commander who is intentionally attacking civilians, then you have a duty to do something to prevent that. And if you don't, and you could have, you should be accountable for it. So ironically, the command responsibility standard is more of a reckless standard for an intentional violation by a subordinate. In terms of the categories of, of circumstantial evidence, I, I, I don't think that there's, there, there, I mean, 
I think one of the reasons probably that, that Guy reacted the way he did to the paper is it's kind of a blinding statement of the obvious, right? That we should be looking at the totality of the evidence and assessing culpable states of mind. But I think as a methodological approach, it would be useful for um, judgments that are making these findings to be kind of following a framework, like here's the categories of circumstantial evidence that we focused on, and here's how they influenced our finding, because it supports the ultimate um, objective, which is to place effects in broader context and not become over-reliant on them. And that was my point about bad facts making bad law. You can have cases where effects are probably sufficiently probative to prove a criminal state of mind in and of themselves. But if you make that the norm, then that's going to be the singular focus going forward, which is potentially misleading. So thank you for, for two fascinating um, presentations. In the interest of time, just one question to Manu. Um, so I just wondered whether I could push you a bit further on what you would make of this, um, these adverse effects um, on humanitarian action in legal terms. Um, and so is there any legal grip that we can um, get on this? And here my thoughts went back to some work that you did way back on um, with the, the Oxford guidance um, on the relief operations. Um, so there we there are obligations in certain circumstances of um, third states um, as regards facilitating humanitarian operations. Um, and now, of course, I know that these obligations might have had other settings in mind. It might have been more about giving consent to letting operations through your territory. Um, but thinking, you know, a bit creatively at this stage, um, do you think there is any any anchorage point um, for for saying that not including um, exceptions for humanitarian action into sanctions um, violates the law? And perhaps looking to the future. Um, if you say that now we're seeing perhaps patterns of practice um, to that effect, um, could that point towards the emergence of, of a customary rule at some point? Thanks. Let me reply. Yorohi, I was shaking my head going, don't worry, I didn't. But <laughs> um, there's, there's no practice at all. So as I was saying in my reply to him, um, to you, Val, we've got the amendment of the Canadian law in June 2022 that says that foresees the possibility to create legal regimes allowing for the forfeiture. So it's it's all still waiting to happen down the line. So I've got no practice. Oh, let me answer. <laughs> um, Alexander, sorry. Preponderance. It's not a criminal thing. No, 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 no. Well, but presumably you. You know, they've got to have played some role. I mean, this is the, the challenge, I'd say, um, if it's the actors that are directly responsible for the, these activities. So it's, it's interesting. So far, the experience, uh, the focus of the actors that want to change the law on this has been in relation to torture. So the individual perpetrator of torture or corruption, where it's far easier to establish the individual responsibility. While uh, when you look at the range of activities that can lead to the imposition of sanctions, and I haven't looked at that, they're numerous and not, main, not all of them are necessarily violations of the legal rules. And therefore, it's a lot harder. It's like you are providing support to. Um, so it, it's really a different can of worms. And I think these are the challenges that are going to have to be addressed going forward. So for example, all the various oligarchs do they all have, have they all been to a legal standard involved in the commission of violations or support of the violation of you said bellum, you said bello? I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but these are all the questions that need to be asked when we move from torture, corruption, to the other broad grounds on the basis of which sanctions can be imposed, um, designations made and assets frozen. These are the, the well questions. Alexander, yes, all very good questions. The conversation's actually quite advanced with states. It's been going on for at least 10 years. I think it started in, it came up most evidently in relation to the famine in Somalia in 2010. And I would say that there's generally an acceptance by states that there is this 
unintended impact. I get a bit frustrated because I might say it's unintended, but you're, you're definitely aware of it now. So let's try and find solutions. And I think the conversation really has come along. I think the devil is in, when we're looking at conflict settings, so when, we've, when it's clearly, it's impeding the capacity to respond in a, as foreseen by IHL, states say yes, and then the devil is in the detail, which actors should be covered by the exceptions, which should be required to look for, um, to go and ask and get specific authorization, specific licenses that are time consuming, labor intensive. That's where we're at in the conversation. I think it's um, a very positive development is that the US, um, and Ireland have put forward a horizontal exception that would apply across all UN sanctions regimes that would exclude both humanitarian action and also activities necessary to support meeting basic human rights, which are development activities for a broad range of actors. So I think that would be very positive. Obviously, sanctions are very political, and it's interesting to see that <coughs> now happening at New York level, pushed by the US. And they were the tricky actors a couple of years ago. And now it's at EU level that we're having problems. Sanctions are very political. So when you try to deal with EU states on Ukraine-related sanctions, Russia sanctions, even though you can really see here's an, an unintended com a consequence, it's evident that if you designate a huge commercial bank and say funds can't go through it, it's going to be very difficult to make very basic payments to non-designated entities. The reply we've had is not encouraging. It was a very political reply. Why? It's interesting to see the lawyers, re the legal representative of the EU member states said, that's fine, it makes lots of sense. The political representatives, mm -hmm. who are the ones that develop the sanctions regime, say, uh -uh. And I think the, the next battleground is development action. Nexus, mm -hmm. development, there, there's a far greater reluctance of the actors that impose sanctions to include safeguards. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much. And may I conclude the session? Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Thank you.